This is Friday, May 13th, and this is the National Museum in Tehran. Please, why are you ignoring me? <laughs> before the revolution, before 1979, in the same place we had two writings which were the words of the king. Reza Shah, who says that I made this place to show who you were in the past and what you had in the past, so that you can learn and repeat the good things that happened in the past and forget about the bad things that they did. On the top of the door, there is a marble stone with some kind of black, you know, signs in the middle. That black uh, thing in the middle <coughs> is the sun, and that bigger black thing is a writing, but in a very stylish way, and that's a proverb in our language, which says, the knowledge is the power. As we say, and then when we go inside, uh, we can see things from the ancient Iran, prehistorical period, and historical period. The building itself looks like one of the ancient uh, palaces, very old, back to almost 2,000 years ago by the time of the Sassanid. This was the same style of the Sassanid palace in Tisfun, which was a city near the border of Iran and Iraq. It was almost destroyed during the war because it was on the Iraqi side and nothing left. But this was almost the same thing with a very big arch as you can see here. And when we go inside, first you have to check the security and then I will talk about our map and other stories. Please follow. <coughs> We have Pakistan and then we have Afghanistan. These are the countries that we are bordering. Now, in the middle of the country, you see there are two big deserts one here and one in this area. The hottest spots that I mentioned yesterday, 79 degrees Celsius, was somewhere around here, which was measured by the satellites from NASA. Uh, Persian Gulf and Caspian Sea, back to thousands of years ago, were connected and this land was totally under the water. And little by little, these waters went down and the Iranian plateau came out. Iran is also known as Persia. Before we go to uh, the historical part, let me explain about the word Iran and Persia. The word Persia is a Greek name. The Greek called Pars, as Parsia or Persia or Persiski or Persia which is the name that most of the people know from Iran. But the word Iran is a much older name referring to the whole land because the Pars was a big province, almost this area here, which the first empire, which, said, which was set by Cyrus the Great, who was from the Pars area, was known as Parsi or Persia. So the Greek in those days, they call okay, this is the empire of the Persia, which actually was the biggest empire of all time. And then we have the name Iran, which goes much longer time before even the Pars existed. The word Iran comes from the Aryans. The Aryans were the group of people who moved down from the northern part of the current Iran country to the Iranian plateau and they were divided in different groups. Some stayed in the north and east, some stayed on the western side, some moved to the central and southern part. And from these people, among these people, some moved to the south, east, and moved to India. Again, from India, there was a big movement through the country of Iran going to Europe. So there are all Aryans, which the name of Iran comes from, Aryans. Originally now, Iran is Iranians, which little by little later it became two 
I re-entered Iran. And from this movement, we also have Indo-European language as well. And it's all about this movement of these people. We are talking about up to time of something about five to 6,000, 7,000 years ago. Then, this is like a prehistorical period of our history. The people who lived around the Caspian Sea in the north later were known as the Parthians, which is different from the Persians. The Parthians in the west are also known as Partisans. The word Partisans comes from the Parthians, which later we will get to their part. They were almost uh, first and second century BC. Then we have the Medians or the Medes who live on the western side of Iraq. And then we have the Achaemenid, which lived in the land of Pars. And Cyrus the Great comes from among the Achaemenid. Because he was in the Pars, we know him as, we know ourselves as the Parsians or the Persians. So, uh, back to almost 2,700 years ago, the Achaemenid got united with the Medes and Babylonian, which were between the Tigrid and Euphrates in Iraq, to stand against the Assyrians, who always attacked these countries, destroyed them, sacked them, and killed people, and went back to their land, waited for a year or two, and then came back again. So they had to stand against these people. So they had some relation to stand against them. To make these sides stronger, the Academy and the Medes decided to have some kind of blood relation, as we call it. So, the son of Achaemenid, which was Cambyses, married the daughter of the Medes or the Median, and the result was Cyrus. As we know our country as Kulosh, rather than Cyrus. All the names that you hear in the story are written and said by the Greek. So that's why Cyrus is actually Kulosh. Darius is Darius, or the strangest one is Xerxes. Which in our language is Hasha Yor Shah, because it has been <laughs> But because it's all written with X, and X in the Greek language sometimes pronounced as She, so it must be She, something like this, it's very close to Hasha Yor Shah. <laughs> anyway, so the name that you hear, I wanted to mention, that these are most Greek names that you hear. So if you want to know the Persian name, you can ask me, but some of them are also close. So Darius and Darius are rather close. Cyrus or Sirus or Kurosha are somehow related. So, uh, after Cyrus started the Persian Empire, the little by little the empire got bigger. The first place to be added to the empire was Lydia, which is the Turkey now, and then later Babylonia, Egypt, and then in the Central Asian countries. One important thing for you to know, probably you may know, is that all the countries around Iran, ending with Istan, were states of Iran, because Istan means a state or province. Afghanistan, Pak. Stan. Even India is called Hindustan. Hindustan, the state of the Hindus. Uh, for example, Armenia, that's the name that we say nowadays, Armenia, but the old, I mean the original name that we say is Armenistan, or state of the Armenians. And Georgia is an interesting one. Everybody, you know it as Georgia, but that's, the actual name is Gorgistan. We call it Gorgistan. So these are the names that they were part of the Persian Empire, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, we, when we go to Uzbekistan or the Uzbek come here, they just simply talk to each other with no problem because they speak very few Persian language. Even in Afghanistan, they also speak the same language. Uh, after this, you know, empire got bigger and bigger, so which we know as the Persian Empire. Uh, then came the Seleucids. The Seleucids are the descendants of Alexander the Macedonian. Alexander defeated the last king of the Persian, known as Darius III, and then he conquered the four capitals of the Persians. The Persians had four capitals. Persepolis was the most important one, the spring capital, which was the ceremonial hall, and as the Greek call it, the richest city under the sun in those days was in near Shiraz. The other capital was Ekbatana on the western side near Hamadan, which was the capital city before the Persian Empire of the Medians. We had Babylonia, and then we had Susa. Susa was the capital uh, city of the Elamites. 
to get back sometime before even the Persian and the Medes, these big tribes of the Elamites live on the south of west, southwest of Iran. This is the province of Uzbekistan nowadays, which most of the oil also comes from this area as well. These were very civilized people. They have like the history of four to five thousand years ago. They created greatest things in the history in those days. For example, one of them was the water filter in those days. The arts of metallurgy was done by them. They could actually melt, you know, these different metals, mix them, make some alloy. That was why Iranian could defeat their enemies in those days easily because the type of the weapons they used, the swords and the spears they had, were very strong because they were a mixture of different types of metal. Which this is because of the people of Elamites. And later, their capital city Susa became the winter capital of the Persian as well. Um, uh, as I mentioned, that on the north we have the Caspian Sea. The, Cas uh, the reason why they, ca they call it Caspian is because there was a tribe called the Caspians who lived all this area. And that sea was known after them as the Caspian Sea, which is the biggest lake on earth. Uh, the countries which are around this Caspian Sea are Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Turkmenistan, and Russia. They're all around this huge peak uh, actually in the sea. Uh, one thing that everybody asks, because in Iran we have two states called as East Azerbaijan and West Azerbaijan. What is the relation between the Republic of Azerbaijan? Uh, during late 19th and early 20th century, one of the ambassadors of the Russian <coughs> was killed in the city of Tabriz, and the Russian attacked our country. They occupied Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, and Abkhazia. These were all parts of our And they were just coming all the way down, which the Iranian king asked them to stop and said, we can pay for the death of this ambassador. His name was Rivaidov, if you have heard his name already. He was one of the people who was against the Russian uh, central government, the Tsar in those days. And they wanted him to be out of the Russia, so they sent him to Iran. And it is said that he was set up by the Russian to kill him and then play the Iranians so that all the Russian troops can come to the Iranian land. So they occupied Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. So when they stopped the war, they had a contract that they keep these lands for 100 years. But before that 100 years was over, USSR was gone. So all these countries became independent. That's now we have the country of Azerbaijan, while we have East and West Azerbaijan in Iran. Make it a little bit short not to make you standing long here. We can go to the other parts. From here to the wall back there, we have pre historical period with some objects, which I explained some of them. And from there, it starts at the Persian time and goes all the way by the time of the Arabs invasion. Okay, this way, please. Testing, multiple choice, or guess what? It's the the name of one object which many people consider it as uh, the object which started the civilization among the people this is responsible for the human being uh, civilization. Does anybody know how? That's, uh, that's not the object. Religion. Religion is not also the object. You can use it as an object but it's not. No, not writing. The wheel, no. No. The plow which is related to agriculture. When people started using the plow and then studying agriculture, one person worked and five were free to think and to create things. So art came out of this plow. He was working and they were thinking, okay, let me paint something, create something. So they started actually making pots. And then they started to do some paintings and then later carvings. So the first the early types of pots, which later we see on the second floor, that's a variation time back to 5,000 years ago. These objects are almost from 3,000 years ago, but up there, second row, we have objects from 5,000 and beyond. Uh, the first type of you know, potteries were rather thick, big, and heavy, and they were all sun dry under the sun. But later they learned how to make them smaller, thinner, and then heat them. Kilns, and kill them, uh, heat them, and create stronger but smaller ones more uh, usable at home. So we have many objects, and uh, you know that in every part of the world you go, there are some type of animals or plants or something which are the symbol of the countries or 
the people like them very much. For example, in Iran, Ibex, or the mountain goat, was one of the symbols. And everywhere you see the picture of Ibex, you always see a big round horn, which that horn represents both the moon, like a crescent, and also round things like the sun. Over here, on this one, for example, you can see the Ibex. Look at this one, this is an interesting object because before Walt Disney could make any animation, the first you know, moving pictures were done on this object. If you look at the picture on this paper over here, you see there's an ibex jumping over the tree, eating and coming down. So if you just spin this around, you see an animal jumping up and down. As shamash, which in nowadays in Arabic language, sun means shams. And in those days they called it shamash. So that is the symbol of God, he is having the stick of guidance and the ring of power <coughs> offering to Hammurabi and he is standing like this in front of him as a sign of respect. And on this uh, stone we have 284 rules all written in cuneiform inscriptions, which talks about the marriage, the land, you know, the water and everything. As you can see in the back of this book, so the archaeologists, the scientists found that because they lived in an area which was surrounded by the mountain and on the other side of the desert, generally they were not in touch with too many people in those days. They had like a very close society, but they, they were very developed, very advanced. So they had their own type of writing, but because they were a civilization, their language and their inscription was used by the Persian to introduce the empire. Uh, to the world. These were the same people, as I mentioned, that they uh, made the first fall of water filter. They had this river running and they just dug a big hole and they started filling with different layers. Big stones, like smaller ones, sands, ash. And they repeated the same layer again and let the water go through all these layers and on the other side it came out here. That was the way that actually they created this water filter to have a clean water. So it is very much the same as what we use these days, but it's more can. So this was the guardian of the temple. Okay. One thing I should mention about the pottery is that these potteries are in two types. Either they were functional, used by daily life, or they were rituals or ceremonials used on different ceremonies. If you see something which looks strange, uh, for example, like the head of this uh, sheep, which sheep was the also source of power, uh, this is not the normal sheep that we have in our thought. This is, uh, I don't know what is the word for the, like a white sheep which is on the mountain. Uh, well, mountain goat generally considered the one with the round big uh, horn. But this is more like a sheep with shorter horns, but it's rather on the mountains. It's not very domestic. I mean, it's not, it's not just like the normal sheep that we have. So we also have the head of this sheep, like this one and that one on the other side. But these are the ones that, if you just notice, you cannot keep it anywhere. So you have to always hold it in your hand. So this means that they were only used in the ceremonies rather than in the day. In the United States, we have big sheep for the It goes round. And the ones that are bigger for are male. Generally, everything is male. Most of the things are male. So these ones are kind of, you know, like around, you know, horns like this one. But the mountain goats have got very long ones, which are different. Yeah. The type of sheep were known as Uch in our language, which is different from Busfan. Busfan means sheep. But Uch means like a wild or untamed uh, sheep. So this name was also sometimes used by some people before their own name. For example, we have famous people who, whose names were Ali, and they wanted to show that they are great people. They were known as Uch Ali, which many people sometimes it look, it might look uh, nowadays may look very funny to have the name of she before one name, but because that name had you know like. Um, very prestigious for someone not to have the name of this man, he was a great man, like a commander, they had it. So that's why you see the head of the sheep everywhere. And uh, if you go to a British, uh, British Museum in London, you can also see the same things in gold from Persia, all made out of gold. There's one object here in the middle, you can see this is one of the very strange things in this museum. If you look at this part here, it's got a small handle and a long tip. 
And generally you should have an opening in the top to fill the water. But if you look at the mirror down there, you see the hole is in the bottom. But the thing is that they kept liquids inside. But the question is how could they fill this pot? Can you guess? <coughs> cork. Okay, cork, you use the cork after you fill it. How do you fill it? Turn it over. How do you fill it? If you turn it over, there is a tip and the water comes down. You look at it. It's got two openings, one on top, one in the bottom. So whatever you do in one way, the water comes out. Submerge it? Huh? Submerge it entirely? Well, that would be one way. <laughs> but they had a better way. It sounds like an ethnic joke. <laughs> oh, wow, this is a very strange object because it looks really strange. There's a bottom. Well, the story is that inside, you know, from this hole in the bottom, comes the tube to the top. And then they actually steamed the water. And the steam went inside and went around and stayed around this tube. For your information, when you get out of the museum, the main door, on the left side, they have put a replica of that that is called cut it from the middle so you can see the interior. Take a look at it. This is a very strange one. Many, uh, many of these archaeologists believe that probably the one who made this spot was just trying to entertain a king or to show how clever he is or to surprise someone that, okay, I made this now, can you use it? So that's why this object gave is... gave him distilled water. Yes. Why it looks like that? Iranian almost from 3,200 years ago, where the followers of the religion called Zoroastrian, which in Yazd we will see the fire temples and we get more information about Zoroastrian. Zoroastrianism, four elements of the universe are holy and sacred and clean. We should always take care of them. One is the soil or the land, the water, the fire, and the wind or the air. To make sure that someone who dies doesn't lose the air, they put the bodies in coffins like that, they covered it with tar. See, we have food from almost those days. <laughs> and then they just bury it down there and they put a cover, like a uh, top on it, and then they totally covered it under the So many of you, you know that the Zoroastrian also exposed the bodies to the birds as well. That was one option. <laughs> to the birds, the birds. <laughs> yes. To eat the body, the flesh, yeah. That's something which is not even practiced in Tibet and in some parts of India as well. But the Parsis, yeah. The Parsis actually are the Persians who moved to India after the Arabs' invasion. But actually their idea got mixed with a lot of, you know, strange things. Stones like this uh, were actually put everywhere when one king attacked another country and conquered some land and set some root by himself. Uh, this piece of stone was brought from Persepolis to this museum. As you can see, it's very well preserved. The faces are very clear and all the details are visible. Uh, there is a story behind this, why this is so well preserved. First, I will introduce the people in the picture. From the right side, we have two soldiers. Then we have the commander in chief of the army, the general. There are two incense burners in front of me. And right here, there's the king, sitting on his throne with his guidance stick and a lotus flower in his hand, which was the symbol of the Persian king. Because the lotus flower or the water lily, which somehow very close to each other, they grow in the water. And in Iran, from thousands of years ago, water was the one that decided lots of things in this country. People fought over the lands because of the water, not necessarily the land, because water gave life to them. So uh, the, the lotus flower actually grows 
in the water, so it's very important. So this king always used it as a symbol of the king. Right behind the king is his son, the prince. He's also holding a lotus flower, but he has his right hand like this as a sign of respect to his father. Before the prince, there is a man whose hand is over the other hand, the right hand over the left hand. He's the priest, he's the religious man. And behind him, there is another person who's carrying something like a stick, or we really don't know what that thing is. It's a dagger or a sword, but just one of the things belonging uh, to the king. And there are two more soldiers over there. But what happened that this piece of stone, naturally, it should be totally destroyed and broken? Because of the fire that the Macedonian, I mean, the Alexander the soldier made in Persepolis. The story is that the priest and the general, they killed the king. And they went to the other son of the king who's not in the picture, the younger one. And they told him that your brother killed your father to become the next king. Immediately the brother gathers all the army, arrests the brother, and kills him. <coughs> because he was the murderer of the king. So when the time goes by a year or two later, he finds out that it wasn't his brother who killed the father. It was these two people. So he arrests these two and kills these two, punishes them. So, this piece of stone was right at the entrance gate of Persepolis, and it was at the reception hall where people came to see the king to say, Happy New Year, dead kings, whatever, and to all dead people in this picture. So, the brother was very sorry for what he did and whatever that happened to his father and his brother. He said that you have to remove this piece of stone from this place, but you cannot destroy it because there's a picture of my father and my brother. These two these two traitors. So leave these in the storage. <coughs> there were two of them. One, the king is facing this way, the other one is the other side, which the second one in it is in Persepolis. But that one is somehow broken in pieces, so they couldn't bring it here, just put, put them back together and kept it in the storage, I mean the treasury hall, better say, rather than the storage, and it's still there. But this one was rather fun, so they brought it here into this museum. The type of stone that they used here, uh, like black shiny stone, which was used all in the whole place in uh, Persepolis. So you can see all the details of these people, their hands, their you know, dressing, the shoes, you know, the seeds, everything, and the lotus flower. One more thing to mention. That nowadays, uh, in our culture, many people consider number 13 as a bad luck <coughs> This was brought to this country by the Arabs. Before them, we considered uh, the number 13 as a perfect number. You can look at this, you know, lotus flower here, down here, and you can count the leaves. There are 12 of them, just like the number of the from 1 to 12. And there is one circle in the middle which makes it 13. The 12 of them are the 12 months of the year. And the round one in the middle is the year itself. So a year consists of 12 months, which makes it 13. Nowadays, our New Year ceremony, which is called No Rules, you might have heard it because uh, even your president every year, you know, congratulates Iranian over the No Rules. Obama wanted to taste some Iranian food. I can pack some and send it to him, <laughs> but he wanted to have here in this country. <laughs> So, Nowruz actually is a 13-day uh, celebration. The first 12 days are the first 12 months of the year, and the last day, which is the 13th day, is called the nature. And people get out of home, they go to the nature, they carry some greenery with them, which have already grown at home, and take it back to the nature. That's the story of number 13 in our culture, which later, after the Arab civilization, everything, many things changed. One of them was number 13. Of the Persian Empire was Cyrus the Great. He was a, he is known, the Greek are always used to be not nice. They're in trouble now. In the old days, because Persia was the greatest you know, empire in the old days, they also considered themselves as a great empire in the old days. They were always against each other, they, were, they had no friendly relations. So, whatever that came out from the Greek about the Persians was not really nice. Thing. But even these people called Cyrus as the man of wisdom. The Jewish people call him the savior. 
and we Iranian call him as the father or the great empire. So when Cyrus the Great became the king, he knew that if he wants to have a big empire, he must have some special policies. His policy was respect and toleration. He respected all the nation and tolerated all the ideas about religion. And he was also clever. He said that our uh, empire is consisting of 28 different nations, so we can get all the good things from them as well. So lotus flower could be something that we got from the Egyptians. The word means city. Persepolis means the city of the Persians. Persepolis was founded by Darius the Great, and later after Cyrus died. Cyrus actually made Pasadena, which his tomb is already there, and we will actually visit his tomb in Pasadena. His nephew, Darius the Great, uh, started making Persepolis. Every year, uh, 21st of March is the Iranian New Year. Our calendar is a very precise calendar. We have the day, the hour, the minute, and the second where the sun gets back to its position as it was in the past year. So our New Year can be early in the morning, in the afternoon, midnight, every time, because it's all calculated by the minutes and seconds. It's not like 12 o'clock later, it's the New Year. No. So it generally happens the yeah, 20th or 21st of March, according to the New Year of the North. Part of the uh, Persian Empire. We call it in English. We call it Persian Empire, but in Farsi we call it the Kamini Empire. Pars was the name of the man, the Kamini was the name of the people. So we call it the Kamini Empire. We can see it starts from Western China, Pakistan, the Aral Sea, Scottish border to Armenia. Ethiopia, Libya, Ethiopia, up to Athens, and then we have here Egypt and Libya, which led to some problems because we're also Athens, but we're not everybody. The Silk Road, the Silk Road actually started from the northeast, coming to the northern parts of Asia, it came down to India, and from southeast to the central part, and from Turkey, and Turkey, from Turkey to Europe. That part is a great uh, wall, you can see the lotus flower here. According to the Greek, they always call Persepolis as the richest city under the sun. Uh, for two reasons. First, because of the beauty and you know uh, grandeur, the greatness of this city building, which later when you from when we go to Persepolis, we can see some part of that uh, greatness in the past. Second thing is because of all the money and the gold and the <coughs> which were collected there, taking all the fire over there. So, Alexander knew where to go first. He knew that the heart of the Persian Empire is Persepolis. Not only they are all there, but also all the money is there. So he went there, and finally they burned the whole land. Yeah. On the top, that's the symbol of the Zoroastrians. In the middle, we have a symbol which generally represents uh, the universe. Naturally, everywhere you go, you see one figure, a human figure in the middle, which is an old man with a long beard. He's got a little power in his left hand, he's got his right hand up there, as a sign of respect. Always in the middle. This, some handicrafts you may see, that this man generally is standing like me in the middle of that one. <coughs> Actually, left arm is visible. But in some pictures, you may see on the other side, like this. But it's important that he's got the ring in his left hand. This is a statue, as you can see, the man excavating in the map art. This is the original site. It was found in Susa. This is the statue of Darius the Great. Darius the Great was the one who continued the way of Cambyses II, which was the son of Cyrus, and conquered Egypt. And because when he entered Egypt, he ordered that children, women, old people should not be hurt and killed. And soldiers who surrender and put their weapons down should not be uh, actually harmed. The people, uh, after he conquered Egypt, they carved this statue of him standing with the lotus flower in his hand, which is gone now, with a small dagger and a stick, which is on the other side of the right hand, and send it from Egypt to Susa. 
which was one of the capitals of the Persians. It is said that this statue existed perfectly in its position during the time of uh, the Macedonian, I mean, Alexander the Great. And Alexander said the head was actually cut by them because they didn't like him and they want to say we are superior than him. So they actually broke it. As you can see, even the original place it doesn't have any head. On his actually robe, you can see hieroglyph writings, and the other side are the um, cuneiform inscription. If you look at this sign here, there are 28 pictures here, which are on both sides of this stone and inside. These are the 28 nations under Persian Empire, and the names are written Persia, Media, Milan, Aria, uh, Parthia, Bacteria, Sophia. These are all from different parts of the Empire in those days, and they're all like this. In the middle there is an Egyptian sign, the king of the water, two of them standing like this. And there is this uh, tree of life or flower of life growing in the middle of the Egyptian sign, uh, which was carved by the Egyptians and the Persians. Over there, this is actually the picture of this, this is brick, colored brick. One of the members of army which you know it in English, I mean in English language, as immortals. Immortals were the soldiers. I, the first thing I should explain is that we have the word in Farsi called Javidan. It can be immortal or eternal. Immortal is the wrong translation of the words of these soldiers. These soldiers were not immortal. They would die if somebody just a heli shot, and this is all left from Persepolis. As you know that Alexander and his soldiers put fire to Persepolis and brought the whole uh, uh, complex down. Later when we are in Persepolis, if you are interested, there is a DVD and also a book called Persepolis Recreated. This is a book and DVD created by Iranian, French, German and American archaeologists and scientists. And in the movie you can see they all talk about everything and they recreate, you know, graphically the whole Persepolis so you can see how it looked in the past and the function, the ceremony. And everything. That's a wonderful DVD. You can keep it at home, show it to your friends and enjoy it. Later when we are in Persepolis. In different languages or? They are all in English. This is, I mean, okay. well, English, well, yeah, Persian. Or you have subtitles or something? No, no. They speak English and they also speak Persian if you want to. Right, you can suck yeah, multi-language, multi Okay, this way please. These are uh, part of the steps from Persepolis, a palace called as uh, the Tripolon, or the palace with three gates. This was the place where the Persian kings had meetings with the heads of other you know, nations in the empire. That they had fun, they talked about different things, probably the steps on the roof a little bit. So as you can see on two sides of the, these steps, there are some people carrying some eating things, like food, drinks, and other stuff. Because this place was the one that they relaxed and they just talked about different issues of the empire. There are soldiers standing here, but as you can see, these soldiers are not having spears or daggers or things. They're just having two sticks means they are. They know that nothing is going on here except friendly meetings, so no, not too much uh, attention to the weapons. On the top, over there on the wall, you can see these brick works, all in cuneiform inscription. You know why they call it cuneiform, because they look like a cone. And because the early type of writings, generally in those days, we didn't have papers. So the only thing to write on was clay tablets. So they had to have sharp pens, very strong sharp pens, which the tip looked like a triangular shape, like a cone. So they had to make you know, some shape. So this is the story of how came from this great inscription came to exist. They had these you know, uh, pens with these sharp points. They just pushed it into the clays and then they made this uniform inscription. As you can see, 
This is uh, uh, the inscription from Apadana, the main central, uh, the, let's say, a reception hall in Persepolis by Xerxes. This is my father, King Darius, who did so many remarkable things upon the order of Ahura Mazda, and then wanted me to make them more. Ahura Mazda, as well as other gods, will support my majesty. Who is Ahura Mazda? Ahura is God and Mazda is great. So Ahura Mazda is the name of Zoroastrianism. As uh, you see at the end of his word, he says Ahura Mazda as, as uh, well as other gods. This means that they also respected the other gods as well. One of the things that made people in Babylonia very happy when they saw Cyrus, well, because they knew first of all the Jewish, you know, society were very happy because he was known as the savior. They knew that he was coming to save them. Second was that he brought the original God of the Babylonian back to the temple. And he says that if you like this God, you can worship your own God. Because in Shushina it was a God, but the commander or the king in those days removed it, sent it to a far distance in the desert and put a new God. Life, Sometimes some figures of human beings having an animal like a lion in their hands, this is only showing the power of a king. As you can see, yes. generally if you just hug a lion <laughs> or hold a lion, the lion never turns his back like there and then as if they're taking the picture. This only means that this man has got the lion and all his power in his hand and the lion is not objecting to this, otherwise he could have you know the man. He's just telling his friends, okay, you are the king. This is only the symbol of a man, very much like a lion. But this is actually a dog. And uh, this is made out of, a, out of a, a very shiny black stone. As you can see, there's a ring around the neck. But two reasons why this is a dog, not a lion. Generally, a lion's, you know, male organ is inside the body. But the dog is outside. If you can see, it's out. The second thing is that lions always have their tails upward or hanging back there. They don't have it between the legs. So you can see the tail is just between the legs. And it's like this dog is relaxing. And you can see the ring that shows that this dog is tamed. Though it looks like a tiger or a lion, it's a dog. You can see where they have found these statues here. And over here, over here we have chalk, oh, sorry, but we have this column. <laughs> okay, we have this column. This column actually was cut to fit the size of this room, otherwise the original uh, height of this column is at least 12 meters. So the columns in Persepolis from, uh, were from 12 meters to 20 meters. This was one of the smaller ones, 12 meters, which they cut it to make Sure that they can fit in this room. The bottom is upside down lotus flower. And you can see the picture of lotus flower. <coughs> From here we have the Seleucid area. Why they call it the Seleucid area? Because after Alexander died in Iran, he asked one of his commanders whose name was Seleucius. And he married an Iranian princess and he became the king of Persia. So that those periods, which is about a century, around a century, are known as the Seleucid era. So from here you can see things are changing from black stone into lapis lazuli, more like uh, Latin um, things, like Greek things come into our culture. If you come and see some of these boxes over here, you can see even the gods of the Greek as well. Alexander conquered Persia and came to Persepolis. Immediately, he rushed to Pasargon. He wanted to pay respect to Cyrus the Great because he always believed that a true king should behave like Cyrus. He didn't care about Darius, who was a great king, who came after him, or Xerxes, who was a really, really great one. He says that Cyrus is the man that we should always remember, we should respect. And according to some book, uh, when he was in Masaka, paying you know, some respect to Cyrus, staying there for a few days, this was the same time that his soldiers and the leaders <coughs> in the group put fire in Persepolis and brought it there. 
because he said that you shouldn't do that. But because Xerxes actually burned Athens, the soldiers said, we have to remain. So they start actually, the fire started at the palace of Xerxes, which in Persepolis, there's nothing left from that palace. So the fire started there, and from there they couldn't control it. They went all over the whole complex and destroyed Persepolis. It was the time that they had to control the country rather than creating something, making palaces, whatever. And 100 people, because people were against them. The Iranians are strange. They do not accept any foreign things in their country. Everything must be original. So they said, that you are now with us, so we want. So they tried to control everyone. So they didn't have time to make palaces or great things. So that's why we have a very short part of the Seleucids. But after the Seleucids, one big group of um, the nation in the north of Iran, known as the Parthians, different from Persians, they revolted against the Seleucids. And they said that we are Persian, not you. So they just kicked them out of the country. And from that time on, the Parthians became the ruler and the emperors of Persia, which they also stayed for almost 400 years, almost four centuries. Here, there is a statue of one of the Parthian prince. You can see the faces are different from the Achaemenid, from Cyrus and his children. They had rather long beard, uh, kind of nose, which was a little bit like, you know, bump over here. But they were coming from the north. My nose is like them because I'm coming from the north. They're coming from the same place, more or less, where I was born. <laughs> so, uh, they're different. They had like a long mustache and yeah. a little beard here. They were great horse riders and great fighters as well. And they had a special, unsystematic way of fighting that confuse all the enemies. From them came the word partisans. You were there and suddenly you saw people attacking from everywhere. They could, you know, just jump. When they were riding the horse, they could jump and sit backward. They could go down and hold, you know, the belly of the horse. They could do crazy things. So that was why they were great fighters. And then in their time also, the Persian Empire got back to the time of the Achaemenid as well. Uh, the type of dressing you see, well, naturally, because they were horse riders as a prince. He was a horse rider. He had a small dagger with some uh, kind of uh, leather belt. If you look at the back, over here, you can see his pants has got special part, like a little cushion, so that he could feel comfortable on the horse as well. You can see it over here in the back. This is the very good one, the one in a very, very good shape, the hair, the hair, everything. Well, he was an old man. Even nowadays, if someone passes away, so he says, he needs to be buried. He needs to be buried because they say that when a body dies, the spirit you know, goes away, flies, you know, goes to heaven, but the body is very impatient to get back into the they did the same Sorry. thing to my uncle, but they were very stupid to do so because my uncle had a heart stroke a few times before and he came back to life two or three minutes later. But this time when he had a heart stroke, immediately just in less than two or three hours they buried him. Uh, he said, why did you do that? Just ask some of the experts to just check the body to see if there's a cause or something. He said, no, he has already done <laughs> people from the same area where the Achaemenid, the first Persian as we know, the Achaemenid, came to power and believed and claimed that we are the real descendants of Cyrus the Great. We are the real Achaemenid and the Persians. So they fought against the Parthians and defeated them. And the founder of that dynasty was called Sasan. That's why they are known as Sassanid dynasty. The Sassanid dynasty were known as the city makers. There were great people helping design the city, and generally their cities were in a uh, circular shape, in a round shape, with a central point. And from the central point, they had alleys and avenues and square, and they had different layers according to the levels of the people. And the central point always belonged to the government. 
They were the people who created the dome. Our dome is different from the type of the dome that we have in the West. And also the arches are also different, which later I will explain when we see these dome. They turned a square into a sphere or round by simply using exactly the same numbers that we use in computer. In computer, you know the numbers apart from zero, which is zero, then we have two. Actually, we don't have to actually we start from, from two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, five twelve, ten something. Ten twenty-six. They uh, actually, when they had a square like this to make it dome, they added four corners. And then they had eight angles. They added smaller angles on every corner. They made it into 16. And they added another 16 to each corner, they made it into 32. And when it went to the 32, it made almost like the round part. Then from this round thing, they start to put bricks to the central point to the top and make the dome, which is one of the most stable structures which can last for a long, long time. Which later in the mosque, I can explain more about that. So the Sassanid came to power and they stayed for almost 300, 300 years, more or less three centuries, and then the Arabs came and then they were defeated by the Arab. This is the time that the Islam entered the land of Persia or Iraq, which has got a long story. On the way, we have our drive on the bus, I will talk more about this. In their time, um, they also carved the stone, they also made things with the plaster, with the chalkboard, as you can see. Because of the connection of the Sassanid in those days with the Romans, because we defeated the Romans four times, four great kings of the Romans were defeated by the Sassanid. Gordianus, Philip the Arab, um, Julius, and uh, Valerian. These were the four kings which were defeated by the Persians. So the Romans could never actually defeat the uh, Sassanid in those days. But later, you now they have to get along with each other, so they got a lot of connection. You can see these are like uh, Roman type of arts, the mosaics. They found you know, colorful uh, stones from the bottom of a river, cut them into shapes, and then they created pictures like that. And the pictures over here, down here, this is the palace of uh, Shahpur, one of the greatest uh, kings of the Sassanid, and he's a statue in one of the caves in the southern part, 120 <coughs> kilometers away from Shiraz. And you can see that their palaces generally were square shape in the middle, they also had like a cross in the middle. Later in Persepolis, when we go to Nakshir or Stamboul Necropolis, you will see huge crosses which were created 500 years before.
We now show the titles of seven of our Iran videos produced thus far. At the top of the screen is the URL for our Conscience Films YouTube site where they can be seen. These videos were produced from over 15 hours of high definition video and over 4,000 digital pictures we captured during our two weeks in Iran in May of 2016 using a Canon XA25 professional video camera and Nikon D750 digital camera with Nikon AF-S 24 to 70 millimeter 1 to 2.8 lens. In closing, we just want to emphasize that if anyone has the opportunity to visit Iran, they should by all means take full advantage of it. The country is remarkable in terms of its very old and extensive history. The many archaeological sites are quite fascinating. There are in fact some 20 World Heritage sites. The people are very welcoming. They like Americans, they like tourists, they're particularly fond of Americans, and we believe that the bad press that's been given Iran and the Iranian people is f not justified by any means. In our experience, one couldn't have met more open, kind, and friendly people. Now, we want to thank our guide, who is exceptional in many, many ways, Afshin Pasha. He did a fantastic job of keeping a very large group under control and made sure that we did not go astray in the heavy traffic. And the Nation magazine, which many will know is the oldest continuously published weekly magazine in the United States, they have a travel division now that they call Nation Travels that has been doing some exceptional trips. And it's because of their ability to harness the energies of such excellent guides like Afshin Pasha that it makes the, all the difference.